Welcome to The Conversation. Today's episode explores Jamaica's grooming policies in schools, how they shape, discipline, impact student expression, and explore, or expose rather deeper systemic issues in our education system. Stay tuned as we unpack the complexities with Stuart Jacobs, president of the Jamaica PTA Association, and Dr. Dean Edwards Carr, lecturer from the University of the West Indies Mona Campus. I'm Kwame Thomas. More when we return. Welcome to the conversation. How are you, lady, gentlemen? You go first. Good. I'm good, thank you. <laughs> so, so we have been we have been hearing a lot um, of well, it's not of recent for the past few years, especially um, on the tail end of COVID, about grooming policies in schools, and we have seen where students have been negatively impacted. So, the first thing we want to find out why. Why have the grooming policies remained such a central part of our school's discipline system in Jamaica and whether or not they are still relevant today? I think I want to hear from the parent first. All right. I can't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> you, you <do> that. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> um, school is, a, is the beginning part of that embryonic stage of social development and so we want to ensure that our children are prepared for the world prepare for, for the world in such a way that they are able to be dynamic and very flexible with the changes and rules now <clears throat> the same way that you adjust the curriculum and you insist that certain things are done in order for you to at, arrive at the answer Mm -hmm. to a problem, to an equation, same way it is, life itself is an, equa is an equation you're building up to that, uh, that answer. The grooming policy is one such part of the development of a child in school because they, they learn from uh, that very stage that there are rules set, not because you like something or you think it's fashionable, means that it is okay for that moment in time or for that space. And so, when it comes to the grooming policy, it, it gives you that, that framework of guidance for the school, for the parents, the framework that exists within. And so when we try to deviate from it, then that's where the problem starts. I don't think at any time at all the grooming policy is a problem. It is the human element of the grooming policy of not wanting to comply. So couldn't that be an indication that it's a little irrelevant to today's or a little archaic in that I'm not saying that we shouldn't have grooming policies, but I'm saying how do those particular ones that we see now in school, how do they it, it, help? It would be get good if you give me some examples. Um, if you could give me an example, well, because I don't think there are. Oh, before that, I'll, I'll find <laughs> out. I'm fr I'll find out from Dr. Edward Scar first what, what are her views on the policies and whether or not they're still relevant today. Well, the policies have been around for a while in terms of decorum. Decorum, these things are important. And I think we have lost the plot in the conversation around grooming because we have not focused on the central issue and what it means for young people. The point that Mr. Jacobs made about it being a development part of these young people's lives is really the point. So hairstyle is one thing and how you dress is one thing, but what is it for? And I think it's that part of the conversation we're missing. What is it for? Why do you need to dress and look a particular way? Why do you need to carry yourself a particular way? There's a reason. We have not explained that to the young people. What we have said is, do this, wear your hair like this, don't wear it like this, without explaining to them, listen, part of that is how you eventually transition into the world of work, how you eventually transition into the world period, how people see you and the first impression is actually very important because they're going to treat you based on how you look. And so it's important that we explain that as a developmental theme rather than as a Hard, you know, we, we're focusing on the policy and the compliance rather than trying to explain to them. This is part of your development. So, so I'm hearing a number of things, though. I'm hearing 
that the lack of rules are all the presence of rules without the relationship behind them that's obviously going to lead to rebellion because not knowing what the whys are will cause persons to lash out that's one but then also i heard about um discrimination it might not be it's implicit in what you have just said a while ago that so couldn't we work then to see how we can break down those barriers of the what we can perhaps call systemic um, discrimination as opposed to being so strict in terms of adherence to the school rules? Adherence to the school rule is again a part of the development. Let, let me use an analogy. We play football, yes? Yeah. Boys and girls play football in school. You have to wear a shin pad. You cannot take the field with a shin pad. So that's a protection? No. But at the same time, there is different sizes of shin pads, mm -hmm. different design of shin pads, but you wear shin pads. What the school is saying, this is the size shin pad I want you to wear. Mm -hmm. This is what I want you to wear to, 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 to protect you. Therefore, each school, especially church schools, they have an ethos and ideals of how they think their students should look, ought to look, and it sometimes combines with their religious ideals. We have to respect it. And therefore, the school principal says ladies are not to wear their, 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 their tunic, their uniform, no less than three inches above the ankles. That is the grooming policy exists. And it states sitting out that the school has a right to employ or to, to, to go, go about its ethos and its ideals within that framework. We find a problem with that. The school says, do not wear your hair a particular way. It is not necessarily discriminating. It is saying, this is the, this is the ethos of our school, and that's how you are taught to dress. And I'm saying but to parents, accept what the school is saying. Is it that because we should when just you're going accept, school, yes, though? We should just accept full stop without, because many, stu I, I'm assuming that based on, our, based on the fact that parents, um, well, students rather, those rules are not necessarily communicated in terms of the why behind the rules. Now, the parents are less involved in the school system as, as, as do the students are. So that communication is not coming forward. Now, you're saying that the students or the parents rather should just take the rules as they come and ensure that these are enforced because Yes. How do they align with, with the current needs of, of today's societies and the students, though? When you go into the work world, you have to adhere to... I'm looking at a young man with a fade, a faded hairstyle. Yes. Um, what might be so, so, so wrong with him having a low fade? What is as right? As opposed to... What is right about no, it? No, well, you know what a fade is. No, what is right about it? It's, it's normal. It's the what society, makes it normal? No, because the society has now accepted that. Who, which society? It? Which society? The, uh, the underground society, society no, no. the above the ground society, the established society, which society? Well, Let's first define mm -hmm. society. Okay, go on. So the, like society, your, your so, so the society I'm speaking of uh -huh. is, a, is, a, is a school society. That's where, that's where the child is going. Yeah. And that's what matters here. Not because, not because his, his corner, mm -hmm. his parents' corner, his neighborhood that he lives in, it's fashionable. St. Augustine says it so, so, so up, up, up the well, you know. Not because everyone is doing it makes it right. Yeah. And because no one, no one is, is doing, doing it, it makes, makes it, it wrong. wrong. Yeah, we understand no, that. No, no. Well, I want us to understand it even deeper. If the school is saying that what we are, what, what our society says you don't wear a fade, you're not going to be brighter, you're not going to be in the dancer. But follow the rules of the school. That's what I'm trying to say. No, but Mr. It's, a, it's a prescription you have gotten. Yeah. You have been given a prescription. So, Follow it. So I understand what you're saying, but I'm asking more about the functionality because, one, you have not communicated to me how these rules help me to integrate into society. So I'm your student. You're the school. You have not communicated to me how these rules will help me to integrate into society, but you're just saying, follow the rules, follow the rules. Now, my understanding is rules without relationships necessarily will foment rebellion. Anarchy, so, yes. Because you are not communicating to me properly. You have made the assumption that as a student, my one job is literally to just follow the rules the that school, you have prescribed. The school is communicating. But, but then, there's, a school, there's, a, there's a school book but, at the beginning but of the school if term. you look at what the pedagogies have been saying over the past umpteen years, is that we are no longer empty barrels. So students have some level of autonomy. 
So why not figure out how to communicate these rules, these norms, these mores to the students so that when they come, they can make a value-based decision based on that because they're not empty barrels. I will agree with that, that the, perhaps more effort ought to be made to have that, that dialogue, that discussion with the, with the student body before during, during, and, and during school to, as to explain to, to them why is it that a field is not accepted in this school at this time. Mm -hmm. Yes, I do agree. A more effort can be made. I think, I think what's important, one of the things is important is the, the wider society beyond the school has shifted, has changed. And so people are coming into the system with different ideals, different views. They're going to church schools, but they come with different ideals. So I think the, the conversation about what we stand for, I think we've just put the rules on the table in a book, and that's it. Um, what we stand for as a school body, that conversation needs to be had. What we expect of our students in terms of what we're trying to achieve, the outcomes and what we want our students to look like, that conversation needs to be had. One of the things I have found about the, 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 the conversation about here in particular is how it unfairly penalizes boys. Can because I, I, I think I'll have you hold that until we come back. Um, <laughs> so we're going to our first break. You're watching the conversation where I'm here with Dr. Dan Edwards Carr, university lecturer from UWI Mona, as well as Mr. Stuart Jacobs, the president of the National Parent Teachers Association of Jamaica. You're watching the conversation. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the conversation. Just before we went to the break, you stated you started telling us um, about the fact that some of these these grooming rules or policies unfairly target our, our male students vis-a-vis -vis our female students. How so? Okay, so I want to be very clear. Girls can wear just about any hairstyle to school. <laughs> it doesn't matter how. When I went to high school, our rules said no extravagant hairdo. That's what the school rules said at Mount Alvernia. No extravagant hairdo. That's just about as clear as mud. Well, it was clear to us, okay. right? Um, what it meant, because in a way, we had the conversation and we knew what was extravagant and what was non-extravagant. Right. So girls can wear just about anything. Their edges, big afro, puff, you name it, braids. <coughs> However, for the boys, it means that their hairstyle must either look like Mr. Jacobs. You call it a hairstyle? No, it, 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 and, 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 and you find that it depends on, on, <laughs> like on, on your, prop, your particular racial background. Right, though, because exactly. Because depending on how your hair looks. Exactly. So then there's a, that other dimension of it, of ethnicity. Mm -hmm. So if you are Indian, then it's okay. You're, you're here, you can have hair. But if in some schools, um, and I won't call Mr. Jacob's name again. You can, you can. <laughs> I'm proud of it. <laughs> in some schools, you literally, your hair have to be at a certain length, right? Uh, you can't wear a fade or even a light fade or anything like that. And so you look at it and you think, who is it really targeting? Who is the policy really targeting? Is it targeting female students? Is it targeting boys of other ethnic groups, or is it targeting black Jamaican boys? Because they're the ones who usually end up with, you know, they want a fade or whatever. And the rules are important that you keep, that the grooming, it's very, don't get me wrong. Yeah. But if you go to school looking like Mr. <coughs> Jacobs, they're going to call you Caillou. So uh, they're going to slap you in the top of your head. Yes. So <laughs> which means that you start another round of issues in the school around bullying. So you're creating a problem that you would not have had. Right. So these, these things, now, this, this leaves us to, to question the whole idea. How do these policies impact student behavior, school culture, and whether or not they, they effectively promote discipline? And I think I want to ask you, Mr. Jacobs. Very interesting what you said about the slap in the head. <laughs> 
But um, the Gubin policy, you, see, you, can't see, you can't see where it has protected our children in recent past. Just last September, um, last 2020, 2022 September, some smarty, um, and I'm being very sarcastic with smarty now, came up with this idea to put the word dunce on a bag. <laughs> Remember that? Yeah. And so the grooming policy was used big time to protect our children. That, that bag cannot come into our school. So the, so the principals, the school administration, was able to say it is not going to be allowed in the school mm -hmm. because we have, our, we have our policies here. We have our, we have our, we have our, we have our principles here. That, that word cannot be done. We, we, we were on a bag. So, so that was used to protect our, our children at that time. Um, the, the fact that they hear, I, 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 I don't want us to, to, to look at the, the race thing too much with the, with the government policy. All right, we can switch it a little. Let's yeah. say that my parents are adherents to the Rastafari faith, yes. and I'm going to a church school. Now, I have a decision to make. Do I, do I cut my hair that goes against my religious understanding, or do I wear my hair which goes against your religious principles because you have not communicated said rules to me outside of just saying, groom? Yeah, and, and, well, well, there are schools that have made provision for those yeah in terms of providing, whether it's the Tom school branded mm -hmm. Tom yes. or rap, Rahat. Rahat or something yeah. to wrap your head if you're yeah. a Rastafarian. And, 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 and this is something that happened after the challenge was mounted because... No, no. no. KC really? and Excelsior were the first J two. JC, JC also uh, has uh, yeah, that. In, so, in the 1970s, having... we were allowed Rastafarians in school yeah. at KC. Right, yes, yes, you did. I remember that. Well, okay. I remember reading about that. No, but we look at Portmore, for example. There was a school that, that an issue similar to that was, and that wasn't, that wasn't in the 70s. That was in this decade. That was less than five years ago. Um, in fact, if I'm not mistaken, that matter is still before the courts. It, it is unfortunate yeah. that at this day and age, we would prevent a child from going to, to school when, because the child is wearing a, Rastafarian um, he, um, to, to express their religious um, faith. Um, we, 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 we revere Bob, Bob Marley with his Rastafarian um, um, religion and faith. But why not embrace it with a child coming to school? So I find that hypocritical in all mm -hmm. sense of the word. Yeah. Very hypocritical. So do you Don't see where explain. there's any correlation though between, between grooming policies and how they might impact student behavior? It does. It does. It does. It does. It does. So, it does. I'm, I'd love to hear. Your it it views does. On that. And I think because students don't understand, because we haven't had the open conversation with them, it becomes a thing. Because we've emphasized it as well, mm -hmm. you find that some children who are more daring will say, I'm not going to wear it like that because they want to push the boundaries. And so you find that you might actually be generating a set of behaviors um, that are resistant to, um, and that might even cause bullying in some sense when you usually wouldn't have to, but it's because we've placed so much emphasis on here in particular, because the, the rest of the uniform is also an issue, right? Our children have been wearing these khaki and uniforms for, for, for a long time, largely uncomfortable in a tropical climate. Yes. In a, in, a, in a tropical climate. I mean, some of the boys want to wear the trousers very tight, and we know that's not comfortable for them. They want to be fashionable. But if we explain to them why this is not going to be comfortable for the next six or seven hours that you're in a classroom, and have be, be, because I think a lot of our students, a lot of our children, and a lot of our parents really want to follow the rules and will follow the rules. The majority of our population of students and parents follow the rules. But shouldn't we aim more for, towards um, something that is standardized, far more standardized than, than it seems, as opposed to leaving, leaving it up to the schools for the mm -hmm. most part? Because mm -hmm. I'm thinking that 
there's some difference sometimes between public and private. And the question that I'm really asking, though, is do the stricter rules necessarily lead to better academic outcomes? No. no. Um, Th then why not just standardize? Th th there are three types of schools in Jamaica. <clears throat> there's church schools, trust schools, government schools. You'll find that the, the government, the, the, the church schools are very strict in keeping, you know, maintaining their principles and their ideas and their ethos, yes? And the, 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 the trust schools also. You find that the government schools are also somewhat um, a bit relaxed to some degree. What is, what is important in all of this, though, is there are three, three areas, three participants in the school system, the students, the school administration, and the parents. Yeah. You put the issue in the center and you, you, you have all three sit down and come up with an understanding. Because there's going to be one dictator here, and the dictator is going to be the school. The school has to maintain what, what its ideas are, supported by the, by the parents, and understood and practiced by the students. Because that's what, that, that's what the real society is. You go to a company, the company is the boss. Mm -hmm. Your supervisor is a conduit. You are the employee, you, 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 and, and until you're ready to leave that company, you follow the rules to get to pay. So where's the space for the entrepreneur? The, the entrepreneur in the school? No, 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 because we're looking at, we're preparing persons to, to integrate seamlessly into society. I mean, the, the, I mean in that, in that you know. sit down and discourse, the, the, the child, so, the student is going to get this chance to, to present why okay. they would like to wear a feed. So, wow, present. <laughs> <laughs> I, want to, I, I, I want to go back to where you started, Mr. Jacobs, in terms of the three schools. Yes, we do see relatively good performance coming out of church schools, yeah. and they have, in many ways, maintained the culture. The, the, the climate and the culture of those schools have tended to be standard over the years, and that's because they have a standard set of rules, and people want to go there. For that reason, actually. Yeah. But we must re also recall that there are some church schools that are doing really badly. And mm. we need to under understand think about why, why. Why that is the case. Mm -hmm. And it has nothing to do with grooming. What might it have to do with it? I can tell you. <laughs> Where you have church schools that are not performing too well is um, at times the church itself, the mm -hmm. denomination that manages and operates that school um, might, might be lacking in the resources, lacking in the, in the, in the, in the, human, the human resources also to get their, their people in there to work. For example, I, I, I can speak, speak to definitively with the, the Catholic um, schools. There are some of our rural schools that um, because we do have the resources to really operate and manage them or we want to manage them, they are not, uh, they are not performing as the schools that are closer in the, in the, the urban areas. That's a fact. And mm -hmm. so um, there's, a, there's that effort in trying to, to fix that as, as we speak. So, so she is correct. Mm -hmm. that one. And I've seen schools in St. Andrew, right here in St. Andrew, that have, the, the, you know, the boys can wear their hair like yours or <laughs> however they choose. <laughs> Those children are at the top of the league table. Mm. They're at the top. That's smart. Yeah. That, they're, well. they're at the top of the league table because the here is not mattering. They, they, whether they're wearing a clocks or a, a butter. Know, a butter. <laughs> 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 whether they're wearing a clocks or a butter, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter because there's a culture and a climate in the school which says this is what is important. This is what we expect you to look like when you come out and when you end. And so you find that those children, because they're able to express themselves within, within and reason. not just mm -hmm. within about here, but they're able to find a place where they can identify with, I can do well here. That's what most children want to know in a school culture. I can do well here. I can grow up and be who I want to be here. 
once you have a school culture that is sending that signal, no amount of hair, shoes, or tight pants is going to stop them from doing All that. All right, so as we ease into the break, then what I want you to think about then is whether or not there is room for dialogue between all of those stakeholders. But I'll allow you to, to ruminate on that as we go to our next break. You're watching The Conversation. I'm Kwame Thomas, and we'll be right back after these messages. Welcome back to the conversation. Just before the break, we started looking at whether or not there is room for dialogue between all the stakeholders, and that's that's the question that I want to, to find out now. Because you hear that there's obviously a space for the dialogue. You have stated who the primary stakeholders are, but the fact that we are here having this discussion, in my mind, it means that there's in, there's not enough. There's either not the space, or we're not utilizing it properly to have that dialogue with all the stakeholders. What do you say um, in terms of that discussion? I think it goes back to what Mr. Jacob said. At the school level, there's a, there's a national grooming policy, fine. But at the school level, each school must decide what it is we want our students to look like, what we want this context to feel like, what are the circumstances around how we're training these children and how we're helping them to develop and have that conversation. Once they frame that narrative within the school itself in terms of what we want our school to look like, then you can put everybody at the table and explain that to people and have that dialogue. But I don't think it is something that is to be imposed from outside of the school. Mm. I think it's important that the, t the, the, the tone of that conversation about what we look like and how we look is held inside the school. But, but the fact that some schools, for example, some schools might not, their grooming policies does not necessarily hinder a student's ability to express their individuality while another school seeming, seemingly they're prioritizing that, doesn't that seem as though it sets the, the, the it sets the, the, the whole precedence for discrimination of some sort, where I go to school X, mm. and they have given me the freedom to dress a particular way. <clears throat> and we're talking about traditional high schools, um, whether they are trust government or, or church schools, but they give you that freedom to express your individuality. At the end of the day, what kind of messages are we sending now to our students who might not be going into that particular school, but they're able to see and you want to know, no, why can't I dress like this person? Uh -huh. And they're bright, and they're at the top of the league, as we just said a while ago. George Orwell says it well, <laughs> an animal farm. <laughs> some are equal, and some, some are more equal, equal than some. But, but what I'm saying is... But we shouldn't be perpetuating that, no, no, I'm just joking. I want to, to build it from somewhere mm -hmm. here. And that is the society that our children are going to go into. They'll be working in the corporate world or they'll be entrepreneurs. <coughs> and they're not going to go home with the same paycheck. They're not going to go home with the same compensation package. Mm -hmm. They're going to go home um, differently because they, 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 they've been employed or they're working or own their business in different sectors of society. That is something that, they have, that, that, that they'll have to accept. Therefore, the trust schools are going to operate differently and the church schools are going to operate differently. What you're saying is that the, 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 the government, the ministry then, should have a one set national policy where everybody feels equal going to school. No, that's, 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 that's not what I'm saying. No, that's not what I'm saying. Uh, what, so we know that it, it's, it's, it's ignorant to expect um, equality of outcome, mm -hmm. all right? But what we want to ensure is that the inputs are equal in that the same opportunities that exists for me over this side of the fence is the same thing that exists for you over that but side of the fence. Policy, grooming has nothing to do with input output here. It doesn't. Really? Do, do they it doesn't, not know? It doesn't. In, in, a, in a sense, care. it does. No, no, it does. It does. It does. It does. <laughs> you actually disagree with me. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Well, the, okay. The, the, the reality is that some families we, we are not going to get rid of inequality, mm -hmm. right? We're not going to get rid of that. What we can do is narrow the gap. 
Agreed. And that's our right? aim. That's what we should be aspiring what to. We are aspiring to narrow the gap through education. Because that's the great equalizer. That's the mm -hmm. great equalizer, right? Th through education. So the thing is that some right now in uh, many schools, in many, many schools, there are children who have one uniform or two uniform and one shoes with a hole in the bottom. That is just the reality of it, right? And we've seen, and I'm sure you have heard these stories, where children are penalized for that one or two uniform just mm -hmm. looking mm -hmm. a particular way yeah. and the parents just cannot come up with the third one. And it might have been uniform. a hand-me-down. It might well. have been a hand-me-down. Hand yeah. you're, you're perfectly right. So, so go, go ahead. On. Go ahead, sir. No, yeah. so, so the question really, though, you know, is that whether it's unintentional or otherwise, do, do, you don't, do you not think that this might serve to highlight or exacerbate the socioeconomic disparities that, that might exist among the students here? It does. It, does. it, it really does. And I must say that I know of schools, and I won't call any names, Mr. Jacobs, <laughs> I know of schools where they intentionally prepare for this. Mm -hmm. I know one traditional boys' school in this town. I can, I can tell you of another. I can tell you of another. That intentionally prepares for that, whether it's shoes, socks, tie, shirt, pants, if you Underwear. want it, it's or in a, it, or, or, or <laughs> yeah. badge. Yeah. It's <laughs> there in the guidance counselor's office. Um, they, and if they don't have the size, they'll find a way to get it for you. So a part of it, too, is how we think about the children and who are coming to us and how we actually prepare them to actually sit in our classrooms and be comfortable. A lot of children are sitting in classrooms that are uncomfortable in the shoes they're wearing. Not because it's not a clerk's, but because it's tight and hole is in the bottom. But, and there are principals who look at this and say, I am going to make sure that if a child comes and the shoe's bottom drop off, I can replace that shoe because they, they engage with other stakeholders in order to ensure that they can make these children comfortable. So this, that, that's the side of it that I think we're not seeing as well in terms of, in short, we have to make part of the climate and the culture of schools is that we have to make sure these children are comfortable to learn. And do you realize that if we should go any uniform, any clothes, a lot of kids would, would be more, even more uncomfortable, mm -hmm. that khaki is a big camouflage. Mm -hmm. Yes. It's yeah. a big camouflage yes. because sometimes yes. it's the one khaki you're wearing for the entire week. Yes. But mm -hmm. nobody will know. Yes. And so, standardizing it at the time has worked. That so policy has worked. What is there an alternative that you see on the horizons that can allow schools to explore or to, to, to relax some of those grooming policies so that it can, it can seem to be more equitable? Where Because there are hidden costs that are associated with these things. I mean, I know of some schools, or probably two schools, where they encourage persons to return the uniform so that they can fix them and share it with somebody else. But what are some of those other things that they can take up as alternatives? First thing, don't compromise your, your, your principles. Um, sit around what is considered an understanding table and, and discuss and come, come up with all of the ideas that will make everything work. Because the fundamental thing is that at the end of the day, after five, six, seven years of, of exposure to your school, that child should come out um, a better product than they went in. Ready, in, in other words, the school is adding value yes. to, that, to that individual. And anything that is going to disrupt the teaching process, the learning process, ought to be arrested almost immediately. I say sit with the different stakeholders in the school, PTAs, um, guidance council, school board, of course, and, the, and the, the, the operational side of the administration, um, sit and, uh, and have those discussions. Don't let uh, a school day be disrupted any at all because there's a misunderstanding of the yes. rule yeah. and a flaunting or a deliberate flaunting of the rules. Mm -hmm. Sit, come up with, it, with, with, with the ideas. And, 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 and I said to schools, um, some, somewhat, are they holding on to your principles? They still maintain your principles, but we can give and take with certain things. And, and I said publicly, um, sometimes we could look, look at the hairstyle and say, look, um, 
what happened in the 70s, what happened in the 80s, the 90s, um, what, are we, what are we preparing for, oh. for next year, for the next generation? Are we preparing them to be um, one track in thinking how they, how, how they dress, how they carry themselves? Mm -hmm. aren't, we, aren't we shaping them to be fashionistas? Why don't we let them be fashionistas in school? But at the same time, um, they should understand why they are not being fashionistas now. Mm -hmm. We prepare you to be fashionistas, but you don't have to dress like fashionistas while in school. That's not a compromise. I, th I think um, that you're right. What are we preparing them to be and to become? It's, it's a very important question, you know. And I think um, for as long as there have been schools in Jamaica, there has been khaki. If I'm against <laughs> anything, I'm against that bula suit because... It's the level of discomfort. When you sit in our classrooms, and I think we spoke about this the last time in terms of the structure, and the heat takes you in that khaki or in that tunic with the blouse inside, can we think of more comfortable uniforms for children to learn in? The uniform, yes, as a national policy. But can we think of innovating, of revolutionizing what uniform now looks like? so that the children are not as uncomfortable as they are, because they are. That, that, that seems to be something that the Ministry of Education, <laughs> along with the schools and the respective stakeholders, are supposed to be looking at. But we are going to our third and final break. Um, continue to watch the conversation. I'm speaking here with Dr. Dan Edwards Carr, as well as Mr. Stuart Jacobs. We'll be right back after these messages. In this final segment, we will be exploring the case of an Immaculate Conception High School student who was barred from upper sixth form despite passing her exams, highlighting deeper issues in Jamaica's education system and the need for urgent reform. So we, we have heard, and, and my question that immediately comes to mind is not a case whereby the student failed um, her exams. She passed four exams, she got two with distinction, two with higher than average credits, so she have two ones, one, two, or three, I think it is, and a four. But she was excluded from upper sixth form because of that. Um, is that decision to bar the immaculate student despite her Cape success symbolic of the broader systemic failures in Jamaica's Ministry of Education or the education system? I'll ask, I'll ask you first, and then well, I'll ask you. Yes, <laughs> well, it certainly represents the kind of exclusion that takes place anyway. Mm -hmm. this, I mean, what are we talking about here? We're talking about, particularly at the secondary level, when we look at those exams results and we look at the sitting, we're not talking about all the children who left primary school and went to secondary school. We're talking about a subset of children who were streamed into doing the exam. We're not yet talking about the ones who are excluded. So exclusion is a characteristic feature of the system, mm -hmm. right? And streaming tells you that. So the fact that this has happened is, it's, for me, I'm not surprised at all. What it does say, though, is that on one level, um, you're just not good enough to make it here. Um, of course, the, there are the issue of the school rules and the benchmarks that you have set, and that's important in terms of having certain benchmarks for being a part of um, the school. But I think that when you get to the 13th grade and you have that kind of a result, to be excluded, it, it, I'm sure, I'm absolutely certain, it threw that young lady into a tailspin because having put in that kind of work and then to come back to say, well, you didn't make the benchmark, you didn't, you're not... You're not good enough. You're not good enough, basically, to continue in this school. It, it says a lot about how we think about academic success. And rewards. It, and the rewards. It says a lot about what we think about what the outcomes for schooling ought to be and that only certain outcomes can be palatable. And the fact is that 
at the bottom of the system, we're not doing enough to engage, to enrich, and to empower all our children to do well. And, and I think when you have a student who has done fairly well, it, it shouldn't be that exclusion is the, the stamp that you've placed on that student. I wonder if you disagree with what was being said, uh, Mr. Jacobs. Up to some degree, you know, I, I, I always agree with Dr. Carr, <laughs> since we have been sitting here. But um, Immaculate High School um, has, over the years, um, been undoubtedly one of the best, finest high schools in Jamaica and the Caribbean. Yeah. Um, so certainly for, as, a, as a, a single a, a female school, it's, it's one of the best, if not the best. Mm -hmm. And they have been, they have been the best. They have been consistent. They, they, consistent. They have been the best because they have been consistent and consistent with their rules. They have been consistent with their rules. And, and um, we all know what the rules are going in. And, and it is, first, first, let me congratulate the young lady for, for those fantastic grades. And it's quite unfortunate that she wasn't um, given the opportunity to go on to complete her studies at Immaculate because of... Um, it, it seems as though there's no the space for grace, though. It's like we're sticking to the letter of the law and we're ignoring the, the, the spirit of the law. I'm, I'm not sure. Aren't we supposed to, stick, to teach our children to stick to the letter of the law? And though? not the spirit of it? The letter of the law. Just the letter? The letter of the law. I did wonder whether there was a wider story yes. um, yes. around yes. the issue, yes. um, really. I, I did wonder if there was something else outside of grades that influenced the decision. Um, that, I don't know if that was in the media, but I did wonder if that is an issue. I want to point out something, though, that Immaculate and all the other 40-something traditional red mm -hmm. brick, traditional grammar, high schools, I've done exceedingly well because what we've really done is stream out the brightest and the best. Put that, th there's no reason why you should so, go to Immaculate and not do well. So then that's my, no, my question now. Is it that they're doing well because they have gotten a student the who's best a C students. student or a D student and this student has now moved from a C to no one A, or is it that they have gotten traditionally A students and they have maintained the A students? That's my point. Where's the value? The, the, the value? Where's the value added that we spoke about right. before the break? There are schools in Jamaica who are doing exceedingly well with the C and the D students. Yes. There are yes. secondary schools. We're not hearing about them, but those teachers, the school administrations work very hard. They put in reading under programs. Under trying circumstances. Too. And under trying circumstances, yes. and they would do very well. So in truth and in fact, you, once you go, you go into Immaculate as a student averaging over 98% um, percent at the, in the top 2% of PEP, um, you're going to do well. The school is going to do well, and the school will continue to do well as long as we have this tiered system where some people go here and some people who can't go there. What, elsewhere. So what would be a better fix though to that to that system? <laughs> a placement system that actually accounts for equity, accounts for the fact that regardless of where children should go, they should do well. And part of that is the overall structure of the school system now. Because you have schools where children want to do physics, but there's no physics teacher. Or there's no physics lab. Or there's, more importantly, <laughs> there is no physics lab, right? But that's because they're in a, what you characterize as a non-traditional school. So really and truly, in terms of reform, what are we thinking of when we think of reform? Are we thinking of lifting the standard in all schools to the level of an immaculate? That should be the objective. That ought to be the objective. That ought to be the objective. We agree, sir. Oh, finally, <laughs> again. <laughs> so, no, because the first time I saw it, I, I began to wonder whether or not this, this particular incident, as, many, as well as um, so many others, if this is a reflection of the mismanagement and lack of accountability that, that some persons have been consistently talking about, not just from that particular high school's level, but we're talking about systemically from the Ministry of Education's um, perspective. 40-odd 
um, schools you spoke yeah, of. 46 or 46. 46 yeah. So, yeah, those schools make the, the education system looks very good mm -hmm. at all times. Mm -hmm. But um, when we look beyond that, there are 100, 400 and odd mm -hmm. that, are, mm -hmm. that are somewhat not up to that great. Not just at the feeling, mm -hmm. but the effort to get a child to get four ones in those schools is so great. Mm -hmm. It's so much great. And remember this. Our teachers are taught at the very same teachers' colleges. Mm -hmm. They're coming out with the same curriculum. They graduate the same day, and they come into different streams mm -hmm. with a set of students that are going to be struggling, while some are already so prepared that 2% exactly. is so, so, so prepared. It's to then use the Pareto principle that, that states that 20% of your effort will give you 80% mm -hmm. of your results. Um, let, let, let's switch it. A paradigm shift needs to be done almost immediately, where the effort that we are putting into these 40 at schools will somehow transform it somewhat and spread it to those other schools. Because Vaxal mm. High produced a road scholar. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yes, and so we know the road produced a road scholar. A non tradition. So. A road scholar. Mm -hmm. Aren't there many more road scholars in our, in our, in our country? Aren't, aren't there many more two percentiles that are going to the Macalets and, and mm -hmm. so on that are going to the other schools? Yes. They do because they come in. And so, and so um, that, that infant primary education needs to be more solid. Yes. To prepare, to, 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 to level more the playing field. Because that is what's happening. The, 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 that 40th school you spoke of didn't just come up overnight out of the ocean. Mm -hmm. No. Mm -hmm. Because the preparation process at infant and primary is lacking. Mm -hmm. Hmm. I completely agree. It's lacking. Because yeah. what determines that 2%? You know what determines that 2%? One exam. Mm -hmm. A three-year exam, Pep. In my time, it was com in our time. Our it was time. common, it was common, common entrance. entrance. <laughs> And you are yeah. GSAT, eh? Yeah, G -Sat. No, 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 no. Come on, oh. <laughs> You're dying somewhere. No, 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 no. no. Just for me. Good jeans. Just for me. I agree. Good jeans. <laughs> no, but but as, we, as we ease to the end of the show, though, it, it, it begs a lot of questions um, whether or not um, schools, one, are spreading too much emphasis on grooming policies and not enough. Because I'm not saying that they should stop um, putting emphasis on grooming policies, you know, but they're not putting enough on academic excellence. Um, whether it's a case whereby the government now is not empowering them enough with the resources and the wherewithal, but what are your views on that as we go into, well, as we wrap up? <laughs> oh, boy. I, I really do think that the, the, the emphasis on rules and how children interpret those rules and respond to the rules is very important. So if a school has a way that you need to look to be there, then work with it. Um, it's five years, it's six years, it's not your entire life. Right, that's what I would say. To, I'm speaking to students and I'm speaking to parents. Mm -hmm. Right, work with it. I think though that far more emphasis needs to be placed in thinking about what quality teaching and learning looks like inside our classrooms in order to generate the outcomes we need and the kind of citizens that we need. Mm -hmm. And I think we're not having enough of that conversation. I saw a poll this morning, 70% of the Jamaican people are disturbed about the educational system we have. And that's because we're not allowing the conversation to open up about what quality teaching and learning looks like, what the, the emphasis on, as you said, the academic success and how we get our population there. We have too many children who are moving from primary to secondary school, not literate, not able to read, and completing secondary school, still not literate. All right. 
that's it for today's conversation. And we have uncovered the real impact of grooming policies on our students and the pressing need for reform. A big thank you to our guests, Mr. Stuart Jacobs and Dr. Dan Edwards Carr, the entire Scene TV production team, and you, our viewers. Follow us on all our social platforms at Scene TV and join me, Kwame Thomas, as we explore issues shaping Jamaica and the Caribbean.